Grace and peace to you from the one who was and is and is to come. Amen. The artists Christo and Jean-Claude were known for their large-scale, ephemeral, site-specific environmental installations, often targeting large landmarks and wrapping them in fabric. It was their way of helping us to see the familiar in new ways, to perceive the whole environment with new eyes and a new consciousness. Wrapping massive monuments or even everyday objects like a chair in fabric was meant to breathe new life into the way we perceive reality. Christo and Jean-Claude, two conceptual artists, were convinced that once wrapped, the objects would take on a new identity. The incredible feat of transforming entire buildings and landscapes invited visitors to gain a new sense of place and space. And once unwrapped again, the effects of having concealed them even for a short time left the viewers with a lasting impression. They began to see the objects in a new way. It is a gift to reveal something by concealing it. I do want to argue that Jesus' parables about the kingdom of God had a very similar effect on his audience. They belong to the wisdom genre, the Jewish branch of the universal tradition of sacred poetry, stories, proverbs, riddles, and dialogues from which wisdom is conveyed. It is through his parables that Jesus conceals what we perceive to be real and true in order to reveal a deeper, more profound, divine reality at work in this world and in our lives. By comparing the kingdom of God to everyday activities in the field, in the marketplace, or in people's homes, what seems obvious and clear becomes mysterious, imbued with a hidden and even subversive meaning. Concealing is revealing. The listener's eyes are opened to God's hidden yet transforming presence, revealing an alternative world of radical reversal and paradox. To compare God's kingdom to a woman who does not just play, place but hide yeast in the dough for the bread of tomorrow is to conceal what appears to be an ordinary activity in order to reveal God's commitment to change and newness. And when we ourselves become not just recipients but also agents of such divine change, what is promised for the future begins to inform our present beliefs and actions. No wonder that we hear Jesus' first listeners respond with puzzlement and wonder. What is this he's teaching? No one has ever said anything like this before. Where 
Did he get this? Where did he come from? The problem is that we are so used to those parables that very often they do no longer have the same concealing and revealing impact they used to have for those hearing them for the very first time. We don't get puzzled and confused by what we hear. And we tend to miss the exceptional skills and wisdom Jesus exhibits when sharing his insights and understanding of God's relationship to the world. To compare ordinary objects and activities to something as mysterious as God's vision of Shalom on earth, as it is already in heaven, is to wrap them up, to conceal them, alienating and estranging them, in order to reveal a greater and deeper meaning. This is why I treasure the collection of 114 sayings in the Gospel of Thomas, which some scholars regard as belonging to the very first layer of sources we have of the Jesus tradition. You will find a more in-depth discussion on the Gospel of Thomas and my reservations to discard it as a so-called Gnostic Gospel in the postscript of the written sermon published online. According to the prologue of the Gospel of Thomas, the sayings are hidden or secret sayings. They are hidden or secret in the sense of resisting a straightforward interpretation. They are said to have been spoken by the living Jesus and recorded by Judas Thomas the twin. Already the opening lines of the Gospel set the tone for what is to come. And he said, whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. Jesus said, let one who seeks not stop seeking until one finds. When one finds, one will be troubled. When one is troubled, one will marvel and will reign over all. The process of understanding calls for a committed seeking. Wisdom is not easily attained and might at first even be difficult and troubling. Those who persevere are promised to discover God's reign both outside of and within them. In other words, they will be empowered to overcome their ignorance and truly embody the life and love they saw in Jesus at work. To reign over all has to be understood as resuming control over oneself and accepting more responsibility for the common good. It is a fundamental aspect of the kingdom of God, which can also be translated as the reign of God. But such reign is not about power over people, but power shared by the people, an empowering of all to reorder and manage their lives according to God's vision of a fair and just society and world. Jesus made it clear that he did not come to rule but to serve, and the greatest of all are those who serve their community. This is why I prefer to speak of the kingdom of God to come, a vision of relationships restored and renewed, so that all enter into a new fullness of life. We find a similar sentiment in the Gospels of Mark, Matthew and Luke. The disciples are encouraged to seek and find. But in contrast to those Gospels where Jesus' saying are embedded in a narrative in a specific context, in the Gospel of Thomas those sayings have no compositional order or sequence. There is no narrative, but all we have is a collection of 114 Zen master-like sayings, a genre particularly prominent in Jewish wisdom literature. Think of the Book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the wisdom of Solomon and Zairach. As readers, we are encouraged to search for and contemplate their hidden and secret meaning. It is in this sense that reading the Gospel of Thomas gives us an inkling of what it must have been like for the first disciples to hear Jesus' sayings and parables for the very first time. Understanding is an interactive process calling for the listener and reader to fully engage and bring their own wisdom and insight 
to what is said or written. We have to do without the interpretations of the parables that very often Mark, Matthew and Luke supply us with to share their understanding of Jesus' message. But the first disciples would have reacted and responded to Jesus' sayings and parables in the same way we do when reading the Gospel of Thomas. To be troubled is an important aspect of genuine understanding. I vividly remember a series of Bible studies we ran at Sean Ellinghouse's home where we read through the Gospel of Thomas together. In our quest for wisdom, we were indeed troubled, and there was no expert to order our confusion with the final authoritative interpretation. But we started to debate those sayings with the same excitement the first disciples must have felt when listening to Jesus' parables. Some of the sayings are especially cryptic and riddle-like and call for our creative interpretation. But the Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas promises that those who find its meaning will find life and discover that they are children of the living God. Indeed, sometimes what seems obvious and clear needs to be first concealed before it can be revealed. The hidden sayings in the Gospel of Thomas send us back to the familiar sayings of our traditional Gospels and make us wonder once again. If we are not troubled reading them, their meaning might still be concealed to us. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus comes across as an unconventional teacher, insisting that his listeners need to be actively involved themselves to gain wisdom and knowledge. Such wisdom and knowledge also involves knowing oneself. Knowledge and self-knowledge go hand in hand and are both needed to seek and find divine wisdom. It might even allow us to walk on water, to reign over the watery chaos and restore order. The main human problem addressed in the Gospel of Thomas is not sin but rather ignorance. I'm reminded of Jesus' words from the cross, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus is therefore portrayed as someone who does not save people from their sins, but rather from their ignorance. The state of humankind is described as one of confusion, of having fallen asleep, of forgetfulness, seduced by the deceptive pleasures and pains of the world. Salvation consists in remembering and recovering who we truly are, children of God, light of the world. The massive installations of Christo and Jean-Claude do not just conceal but also transfigure reality, even for just a moment in time. The flowing, running fence made of heavy woven nylon fabric, stretches for over 40 kilometers, drawing attention to the ordinary and often unnoticed rural landscape. It invites us to imagine a different relationship with the land and with those dwelling in it. We are reminded of the endless possibilities that come with genuine freedom. We are made to wonder about political in geographical boundaries, and how arbitrary and artificial the fences we build are. What we name sinful and evil is very often driven by sheer ignorance, lacking the ability to see ourselves and those deemed as others as children of one and the same Creator God. God wants life, life for all, and it includes all of creation. I wonder what kind of installations are needed within South Africa's landscape in order to trouble the waters and bring healing to the land and all its people.
Here's one of my favorite parables from the Gospel of Thomas. Jesus said, God's kingdom is like a woman who was carrying a jar full of meal. While she was walking along a distant road, the handle of the jar broke and the meal spilled behind her along the road. She did not know it. She had not noticed the problem. When she reached her house, she put the jar down and discovered that it was empty. Jesus knows how to get and hold the attention of his listeners. We are to grasp the mystery of the kingdom of God by considering the story of an unfortunate accident, a minor catastrophe. Flour is precious and essential. We see a woman carrying a jar of flour on her head. The sensitive part is where the handle connects with the jar. There's an unnoticed crack, or even a piece might have broken off. When she arrives at home, she has to make a painful discovery. The jar of flour is empty. All along she was unaware that the precious flower she bought trickled away on her long walk back home. The jar itself must have been so heavy that she didn't notice the steady loss of flour. She only becomes aware of her misfortune when it is too late. It is a startling ending. Why would Jesus, the Jesus of the Gospel of Thomas, compare the kingdom of God to such a story. The long journey, the hiddenness, and the sudden awakening all seem to express something of the kingdom of God. What becomes clear, the end only reveals what has happened all the time, unnoticed, like the steady trickling of flower. The familiar image we have for such a process is the image of the hourglass, but an hourglass can be turned around. The parable offers us a more unsettling and complex example, and even though it describes a misfortune, it first of all is meant to convey something positive. The end will not reveal anything new, but only the completion of fulfillment of what is happening right now, all the time, unceasingly not unlike the parable of seeds sown and growing by themselves while the farmer is fast asleep. But one could argue that there is a darker side to the parable, which also evokes a certain degree of fear. What if the end does not present us with something radically new, but only with what is already happening now, though hidden and unnoticed? Then what will the final completion and fulfillment reveal? Will the final coming of God's kingdom not just reveal God's commitment to change and transformation, but also expose our failure to see and notice what was happening all along? Is the parable then also a warning, addressing our ignorance? Should we know better? And what fuels such ignorance? Lack of attention, distractedness, complacency or outright callousness? As we enter the season of creation in our liturgical calendar, the parable should indeed trouble and unsettle us. Do we know that we do not know what we are doing? It is in this sense that the parable in its ambiguity offers both a message of hope and a stern warning. What gives us hope is that God is imagined to be present and active in this world, just like the ongoing trickling of flour, not unlike the parable of the yeast permeating the dough. These signs of hope are often not obvious and at times even hidden, but the end will reveal what has always been active and present, the promised triumph of God's love. At the same time, we are being warned to be more attentive and awake to the potential catastrophe unfolding. Notice and see now, rather than experience a rude awakening at the end when it's too late. In other words, imagine yourself carrying your precious jar, the weight of the world, 
notice the cracks and address the brokenness before it is too late. The strength and vision for such response can come from the aspect of hope surfacing in the parable. The trickling flower does not only speak to our failure but also to God's ongoing, though hidden, presence. We are not alone in this. See and notice the small beginnings. Watch the hidden seeds waiting to sprout. Notice the hidden yeast permeating the dough. Allow such attention to nurture your devotion. Take heart from those who expose our ignorance and have entered the kingdom of God with a strong commitment to do what is right and just. Be inspired by those who allow the future to shape their thoughts and actions in the here and now. I wonder, what do we find easier to see and notice, the good or the bad? Our investigative journalists do an excellent job in exposing the corruption and mismanagement in parts responsible for our present economic and ecological crisis. There is no end to such bad but important news that holds those in power accountable. Such reporting helps us to see where God's kingdom is definitely not coming and clearly absent. It might in fact be easier for us to identify where God's kingdom is absent than to name and remember the good news of where it is already active and effective. And the parable seems to suggest that it is really only at the end that we will truly see, notice and recognize the ongoing and unceasing trickle of both despair and hope. How does one hold those two aspects of the parable together? There's an element of despair and an element of hope. Will things only get worse before we experience the ultimate breakthrough of God's love? Or will God's transforming power catch us just before the economic and ecological meltdown? Will we be saved from it or rather through it? Whatever the case is, the parable is clear in calling us to not wait until we have come to the end of the road. Rather stop and pause now and notice the cracks. We are known to know better in hindsight. This is our dilemma in human tragedy. But can we not acquire such wisdom and knowledge earlier while still on the road? What if the woman would have stopped along the way? It might have helped to end the story in a driven, different way. The philosopher Søren Kierkegaard describes our experiences of holding on to faith with the metaphor of rowing. We are in the boat together, rowing with our back to the finishing line, and we can only see what we have left behind us. We don't know how close we are to the end. All we can do is to keep rowing. What we know is that we are rowing towards a final revelation. Time is not in our hands, but the timing is. And so we put all our efforts into rowing together, keeping in sync with each other, fully dedicated to the present moment and encouraging each other. And God always got our back, turned towards the finishing line. Or have we already arrived at the end of the road, having to confess our moral bankruptcy? We don't know what the woman did after her fateful discovery. It might mark the beginning of a whole new drama. It is up to us to fill the blanks in the story. But when I think of cracks, I always have to think of Leonard Cohen's famous chorus in his anthem, Ring the Bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Even the cracks do not just speak to our despair, but also to the hope of new light coming in through the very cracks we mourn and lament. Such is the wisdom that can save us. Let the light come in. Amen.
as you leave from here. May the blessing of this light be on you. Light without and light within. Light of sun, radiance of moon, splendor of fire, speed of lightning. The face of God shining upon you now and always. Amen. Everything all around us. Look at the world and marvel every day. Look at the world. So many toys and wonders. So many miracles. Look at the sky